Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the, today's webinar. Uh, my name is Steve Sinkula, and I'm the CEO with AgriSecure. Today, we'll be talking through common pitfalls of transitioning into organic row crop production. Uh, a few pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Throughout the webinar, uh, you can, we'll pause for opportunities to ask questions. If you have a question, I will, and you want to ask it, I think you can ask to be unmuted and I will uh, make that happen. We just keep you muted to reduce uh, background noise uh, as a distraction. You'll also be able to ask questions via the chat function or the Q&A function. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in as we go through the webinar. I'll do my best to watch them and answer them, take a break to answer them as we go through the webinar, or I might hold off until we get to a point where we might be addressing your question directly. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And with that, we're going to get into it. Again, my name is Steve Sinkula. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of AgriSecure. And joining me today is Pete uh, Kapuska, and Pete will be uh, talking through or, or, or guiding most of the discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Pete at this point. Pete, take it away. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attendance today. Um, I'll give you a little background about myself. I grew up on a farm in west central Iowa, west of Fort Dodge. Um, Ag biz from Iowa State. Uh, came back to the farm for a little while. Um, left the farm to uh, go into different parts of uh, agriculture uh, at the co-op level at the seed level as a seed DSM and, and regional manager. I've worked in uh, fertilizer and nutritional companies as a, a regional and a district manager. Uh, worked for some startups along the way and have been now with AgriSecure uh, coming into my third year. So with that, um, it's I really appreciate the opportunity that, that Steve has given me to talk about these two webinars. The one last Tuesday was on proper transitioning to organics. And today, kind of bookending that with things that cannot go perfectly well, uh, the pitfalls of organic. So as we start out, most people on the, on the call today or on the webinar are in production agriculture. And this is where we see the world as it is, the status quo. Um, as you look at the graph in front of you, you're seeing that profitability, which is for most people the reason they're in the business, is not always consistent. As a matter of fact, when you look at the past 20 some years, you see very few years of profitability and more often than not, years where there's a reduced level of profitability uh, and that's requiring government assistance to try to keep people going. Um, Albert Einstein once mentioned that um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So as we look backwards at the last 20 some years, it's pretty easy to look and project that forward and saying, are things really going to change? Are things going to be different in the future if we look at conventional corn and I'd say conventional crops in general? There'll be periods of profitability, but there'll also be periods where there's not profitability. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that we compare things with the organic um, pricing model as well. Now, these are, are the market prices for both the corn commodity product, conventional corn, and organic corn. And you can see that overall that green line, that organic price does have a higher component to it. In some cases, pretty dramatically higher. Um, you can also see the gold uh, chart line also tends to flatten out as we've seen more and more um, economics come into play with agriculture. Uh, there again, these are just the market prices. These don't factor in your costs and expenses involved with it. So as we think about conventional agriculture, we've seen market costs going up as we've had more technology, more convenience, uh, more luxuries, if you will, to what we're really trying to do, which is produce a crop for consumption. Um, on the organic side, um, we've seen really nice market uh, rewards. And what you see between those two, I, I guess I kind of consider that kind of a chasm um, that divides both the conventional and the organic. And, and what's dividing that conventional organic those are the pitfalls. Those are the things that keep people from taking that higher market price. Those are the things that you have to do or manage in order to make sure that you can achieve that uh, goal of receiving that organic certification and the organic market price. So 
my job here today is help understand some of these pitfalls. If you want to go to the next slide, Steve. We'll talk about some of these pitfalls uh, that we've seen, or I've seen as an account executive, but collectively as AgriSecure that we've come across. And by no means are these all the pitfalls that are out there. Uh, there are some common th threads that run through, and you might see those as we kind of go forward. So when I talk to people the first time, usually about the organic process, um, we sit and talk about acres. Uh, what makes the most sense? And like so many things in agriculture, when you're looking to find somebody who's really learned on a subject, in asking them the question, hopefully their first response is, well, it depends. And so when we start talking about um, acres and talking about um, what makes the right amount of acres to get started, um, Steve, you could go to the next. Oh, I'm sorry, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. So going back to last week's uh, webinar, we talked about in that transition period of having everything in alignment, having your gears in the machine working properly, your agronomics, your management, your economics understanding what those things are and making sure that they are properly working in the right order so you don't strip a gear, so you don't tear up a gearbox. Um, and, and that's where we want to make sure when we start working in the organic sphere, we understand the pitfalls that are out there so we don't add unnecessary stress to those gears, that we don't add more gears that we can't handle, that we don't tear up that uh, gearbox. So then we start looking at what are the right acres? Where do we start? Um, what makes the most sense? Um, that what it depends on question comes down to, do I start with too few acres? Um, I, in other jobs, historically, when people look at something new, they start small and want to get bigger with it. And I understand that process. I understand that thought process. But there are some real disadvantages to not putting the right amount of acres into the organic basket, so to speak. Um, you're not able to scale up properly. You don't have the right amount of acres to see the advantage of what you're doing compared to what you've done in the past. And especially with organics, because there is delay factor that you've got that 36 months plus one day for when you start the process of uh, moving from conventional to certified organic status, when you get to that first year of organics and you've mastered or you've um, managed to get through the transition period, now bringing in new acres uh, and a new strategy, you've got that 36 months plus one day. So there are people then that look and add a lot of acres. They just say, well, let's just dump everything in all at once. And, and that's not always a winning strategy either. Um, there are some disadvantages of, of bringing too much stress into the operation. And by that, you're going to stretch out the economics of transition um, and intensify them with all the acres. So while it may be an advantage three years from now to have all your acres organic, financially, in the meantime, you're going to be looking at a narrower economic uh, forecast through those transition years. And if you don't make it through those years, it really creates a, a big problem. So you're trying to being under stress, trying to catch up, trying to execute things perfectly on all those acres to make it through the transition years. And that can be extremely difficult for the entire farming operation. So you wanna think about what are the right acres or the just right amount of acres to bring into transition. And those somewhat become self-evident as you start to look at balancing what we're understanding of how this is gonna affect my farming operation and putting it through a budget to see, can I afford these many acres in this situation to manage the farm better in the long run? So when we get to what are the right amount of acres, uh, we talked about too many, too few. Typically, I like to talk to guys about that 25 to 35% of their total acres that they're farming today. And there's ways to qualify or disqualify acres based on a number of different criteria. But you want to be thinking about a crop rotation. You want to be thinking about what if I have for available labor, because it is going to take more labor uh, than conventional farming. And the timing of that labor, as we saw in that first uh, webinar a week ago, the timing of things is very important. Uh, you can't come back and 
and take time in the summer that you needed to have in the field in the spring. It, it, you've got to be able to manage that time factor of things. And of course, the economics uh, that are important too. So you want to make sure that you've got those identified target between 25 and 35 acres or percent of your acres, and then qualify those farms to make sure they are good fits. Yeah, when you, when you look at those, how do we figure out what are those best farms or worst farms to put in? I know from my seed days, typically when I would start new with the farmer, we would talk about what's your best hybrid and putting it on the best field. But invariably, it would end up on the worst field because farmers' expectation is they want to minimize their risk. So to understand properly where organics fit, you need to understand both how you want to minimize risk and maximize the opportunity. So as you think about, well, I've got a poor producing farm, let's go with that organics because it'll be less of a financial risk, less of um, uh, a stress maybe. Uh, the problem if it's not a really good conventional farm, it's probably an even worse organic farm. And the experience there would be very devastating. As a matter of fact, I think there's a lot of cases where I can make that those poor farms probably have the most advantage by using all the technology that we can, whether it's because it's a poorly drained field, for example, you might have more weed pressure. So more weed pressure, maybe those convention that field needs to stay conventional to manage weeds. Whereas maybe that home farm, that piece of ground that's been in the family that we've meticulously maintained and we've done all the drainage on, and we've got everything that's a well-oiled machine, all the gears are working on that, because we've got that in a good spot, that's probably a very good candidate to look at producing organic bushels. Because there again, producing them is gonna be easier because you're able to manage more of the risk by having a better uh, yield environment uh, for growing crop, and that helps in managing weeds. But then also you're getting more of that return on the investment. Those bushels that you do produce are then more valuable. So understanding both of those concepts and then being able to match those with what your expectations are is important to avoiding the pitfall of picking the wrong fields for the wrong reasons. This is one of those slides I really kind of enjoy talking about. So many times people have come into organics with an idea of what organics are. They've heard some things, they've talked to some people, they've taken in some webinars, they hear some really good ideas. And they think all I gotta do is take that really good idea, bring it onto my farm and it'll work the same way. Well, things don't work that way. Um, we've seen over and over again, people that have tried to replicate exactly what someone else is doing on another farm, bringing it to their farm becomes a disaster. And a lot of times to make matters worse, then they'll go ahead halfway through their plan, copy and paste another plan. And then they hear another good idea. So then they'll copy and paste another good idea. And pretty soon they've got more copy and paste and less of a plan. And to me, that's where organics start to fall apart and that pitfall, that, that loss of opportunity and value really come in. It's, it's really important as we talked about in last week's webinar to put a plan together with competent people and work the plan and make very few changes. Certainly along the way, there's gonna be weather events, there's gonna be things that pop up. Working with a team of people that can help get the best of that situation are important. Um, but having that plan and keeping it structured makes marketing a lot easier as you're able to identify and hit that market because you're sticking with a specific plan in a rotation. And it also gives your crop insurance and your banker um, peace of mind knowing that you're doing things in a consistent way. It may not be perfect, but the expectation is we put this plan in place to succeed and over time then it will succeed. And as we talked last week as well, thinking more about a, a plan and a rotation than an individual year by year crop scenario uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, in the ability to flatten out and manage labor and equipment properly, in terms of uh, understanding and, and putting your marketing plan in place where you've got a consistent level of, of income or a consistent level of bushels or tons of um, alfalfa or grass being produced, it flattens out and evens out that stress factor of trying to do all corn one year and then I've got to do all grains the next year. So do I have enough equipment to do all that? Um, so when you really start to stretch things out, stretching that rotation out, thinking in that longer 
um, time frame, both in terms of managing, but then also in terms of budgeting, it does help that transition period and balancing in with two or three or five or seven years then of organics to see exactly what sort of value you're producing by taking acres and moving them from conventional to certified organic. And I'm just going to hop in, Pete. Um, I was one of the one of our partners uh, who's in organic says it really well that you know with transition there's a transition that needs to happen in the field, but there's also a transition that needs to happen between your ears, and that in your mindset and really changing that mindset to um, to adopt that longer term. Uh, thinking, and that's one of the things that often new organic farmers, or even some organic farmers that have had a few years of experience, really s struggle with. And that's where having a thought partner or somebody to work with you and help keep that in mind can be really cr critical. I agree totally. I, I think there's uh, one thing as conventional farmers, we're coached to think about the world in a certain way. And we tend to think about maximum bushels. We, we've got to raise maximum bushels every year, and then we've got to protect those maximum bushels. And then we, we've got to go ahead and market at the top end of that market every year in order just to stay in business. So it, it does take a little bit of a, a, a mind shift to think about organics in such a way as it's not about raising bushels so much as it is about raising dollars, you know, over that time frame, not just one year. So when you think about a rotation, when you think about um, what's my investment and then what's my output on the other side of it, and then how much control do I have in that scenario? And, you know, am I, am I so fixated on the gross rather than the net? You know, do I, do I just like to see a lot of money coming through my account or do I want to make sure at the end of the day I've got a lot of dollars left over? And then how do I process things like whether things are essential or whether things are luxuries? Um, you know, we're, we're really lucky in agriculture on a yearly basis, we can see that putting a seed in the ground, it tends to grow, it tends to produce more than that one seed. Um, so when we start looking at adding to that process, are all the things that we're adding to that process a net positive or net negative? You know, I, I know right now a lot of farmers are thinking about their seed choices for next year and they're trying to evaluate whether the genetically modified traits have value or not in their operation. In the past, maybe they did. As they look at the economics today, now they're starting to wonder, am I really seeing the value out of those stacking of traits on my farm? And looking at those things now, maybe they're a luxury that they either can't justify or can't afford. And now they're thinking more about the necessity thing. And, and to me, that's where I think successful people in or, organics are is that they tend to think more in that area of what are the essential, what are the necessity things that I need to do, the minimum of things to get the crop that I expect, and then from that, we'll work on adding luxuries. In the conventional side, you almost have to have all the luxuries just to hit your break even. And, and that really does change how you go to the field every day and how your head hits the pillow at night too. So these are all conversations that, that I enjoy talking with farmers and, and having them help clarify what their perspectives are. And, and I think it helps us then do a better job of meeting the needs that they have. Um, right up front, I'll say I am not a crop insurance agent. Uh, that is a very specific talent, uh, especially for those that are dedicated to organics. Um, so, but it is an extremely important part of managing risk on the farm. And quite frankly, an area where most farmers fail to meet the threshold when they get to organics. They may have a local agent who's done a very good job with them on conventional farming. Um, it's been a repeatable skill for them. They've been in business a long period of time. All their farmers are conventional. Relatively speaking, they all drop into one or two buckets of how they look at the world. But organics tend to be a lot different, especially as you start adding the complexity of a rotation. And with transition, this is one of the pitfalls we run into because when you move from conventional to transition to organic, you're gonna reset your APH. Each county in each state has an assigned APH for transition in crops. And you can see from the graph on the left that for most places, and I would say 99 plus percent of the places, the transition APH is significantly less than what you're gonna have conventionally. 
your strike price because you're not getting an organic premium in the market is gonna be the same or similar based on coverage options that you're using in your conventional and with that coverage the same. So when you look at that bottom line, in transition, you are taking more financial risk with your crop insurance, not covering more expenses that are out there. That's another reason to think about rotations to help and manage risk rather than just pushing corn and beans through the rotation. Um, but getting together with your crop insurance and understanding exactly how that transition two year period works for your crop insurance is extremely important. Um, there are opportunities out there that, uh, for example, two years ago, Mother Nature gave uh, a lot of South Dakota and, and Western Minnesota a lot of prevent planting acres um, where the crop insurance was set on um, conventional program uh, approach, but yet they weren't able to put chemistry and technology out that, that restarted that clock for organic. They took it that and were as a transition year. Um, not likely it happens every year, but somewhere it will happen on a yearly basis. It's, it's therefore important when you work with your crop insurance agent that you're properly covered with the proper tool so that you don't defraud or don't misrepresent the situation to the government as you're going through a transition. That can be very difficult financially at the time and then going forward. Another thing to think about, and this is geared maybe a little more towards the organic side of things, but I've talked about the negative side of, uh, of that APH when you're going through a transition. As you go to organics, you're going to start at a similar APH. But there are strategies that are allowed that are best management practices to think about how to bring up that APH as fast as possible by putting crops in a rotation in a field uh, maybe in smaller units than you otherwise would to build that APH because that APH averages in over the course of a four rotation crop. So if you just plant corn once every uh, four years or, or three years on the farm, it's going to take quite a while to average your APH up to a higher level. But if you've got a field that's say that quarter section in the lower um, right hand corner uh, field map where you're able to put three crops in, each year now you can build an APH, building that coverage dollar amount or bushel amount, which then will increase the dollar amount. Because when you are in organics, the strike price, if you're just looking at that regular um, coverage that most farmers get today, is significantly higher than the strike price is for uh, conventional acres. So this is one of those second level discussions that we can start to have as we're thinking through transition about, okay, as we're coming into the end of transition and making sure we're positioned for organic, this is one of the things we want to be thinking about as we manage risk with a crop insurance uh, policy and with the agent on board. And this is another reason why it's important to have an agent that understands how organics function and how to manage risk within organics. This is not something that most agents in the field today are actively thinking about. Certainly there is a nice premium in the marketplace for organics, but that doesn't excuse the fact that you still need to manage things well. You can't expect to have the market price bail out poor performance on your farm. So we have seen in the past, maybe you've got a neighbor, or maybe you've uh, always uh, thought of organics this way that You've got a farmer who's farming 100 acres, there's weeds everywhere. How does he stay in business? Well, the market price is just high enough that with a half a crop, he can continue farming. That's no longer the case in organics, that you do have to do best management practices and take advantage of that market price to have a good sustainable um, experience within the organic uh, farming operation. So, when I talk about bailing out on, on getting a higher premium, you can see with this graph below, that there is a, a tremendous variance in the uh, break-even bushel amount based on the market price that's there today. Um, we're probably close to that seven to $8 range in organic corn today. So on this typical farm, you would need somewhere in that 113 to 129 bushel per acre to be in that break-even range. 
Uh, but you can see with the movement of the market price and looking back to that second slide where we had the chart showing organic uh, market price, it has moved into those higher price range. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see a two, three, maybe even a $4 range in market price that's available for somebody who's marketing an organic crop throughout a, a growing season or throughout a rotation. So it's just another reason why to be thinking proactively and why to be thinking in terms of a plan rather than a single year strategy. And also why it's important to bring experts into your team. Um, at AgriSecure, we do have access to a organic market advisor within Farm, um, Farmers Business Network. That person specializes in helping farmers understanding the financial risk of marketing their crop and works with them to strategize and build a plan to take advantages of information and knowledge in the marketplace that's not readily available at the local level. Um, most organic farmers have got an outlet close by. They've got a merchandiser maybe that even stops at the farm and, and throws a dollar amount out. But if you're farming, how do you know if that's a fair market uh, expression. And a lot of times what we find is that end users are trying to get closer and closer to the individual producers, eliminating that middleman of a broker. And so if we can help you connect with those people, or if, if the market advisor can, it can mean a lot different market pricing. And it doesn't take a lot of um, information to see a big swing in what's being offered as a uh, price for organic corn, soybeans, or other crops. So when we think about everything that you're doing on the conventional side, I think it multiplies itself when you think about managing on the organic side of things. So if you're managing conventionally, singly by yourself, congratulations, but that's an awful lot of hard work. And I would venture to say that most people then also have a team put together for specific purposes. They have a go-to person for their crop fertility, a go-to person for their weeds, a go-to person for their financials and their bookkeeping and accounting. With organics, I think you need a more robust team and because there's more opportunities for management improvement or management failure. And so surrounding yourself with that team of knowledgeable people that provide a value into your operation with their insights, I think is critical compared to trying to do everything by yourself, um, especially if you're trying to scale up an operation because you need to be focusing in on those things that you're most well adapted to do, which is nurturing that crop from the time it goes into the ground to the time you harvest it. There are people out there and, and AgriSecure is one of them, I think that we can help you manage some of those other things or direct you to those individuals that can give you the best advice to manage situations as they come up. And I think especially when you run into the challenges around weather, it can change a lot of things in a hurry. And it's hard to hunt and peck and find that best management practice or that mess management person when you actually need them. So having people in your team identified that can help with certain circumstances ahead of the season will take an awful lot of stress and pressure off of you when things don't always fall according to the plan. And that can help you make better decisions and have more peace of mind. At AgriSecure, I think one of the best functions we provide is that information clearinghouse where we're working with individual farmers and by extension, then each of us as AEs are working with a lot of individual farmers. So collectively, we're on a lot of different farms seeing a lot of different management uh, that's in place out there. Uh, people that are uh, pushing the edge of uh, production within organics and using the platform that we have, MyFarm, we're able to gather that information together with permission of our customers and then share it back to prospects or customers when they ask specific questions about how to help improve their management. And that platform allows us then to, to set those plans in place, those long-term rotations, go through the execution process where we start as a budget item and then move it to an actual item as that process takes place throughout the year, see exactly where we are at any one point with our budget, with our plans, and then be able to generate value in knowledge by taking that information and having a analysis of that. 
um, a summary of uh, data points on the farm for the field, whether that's financial, whether it's uh, actually uh, field operations through the field, whether it's the financials in, in terms of selling and marketing that grain. So we can put all those together under one entity, one platform. It makes it very simple, very easy for farmers to take more control of their financial operations and help them do a better job of managing the things they manage. At AgriSecure, we've, we've been a cust uh, customer focused um, company because we are farmers ourselves. Uh, we have experienced those opportunities, those uh, exhilarations and those losses that uh, you experience as well as a farmer. We've tried to bring all these uh, experience together with what customers want. Uh, we find our customers want to have people that have expertise and, and understand what's going on in the world of, uh, of organics, uh, not just a casual participant, not just somebody uh, filling out a spreadsheet. They want people who have the ability to think and work in a way to plan out and strategize about what are the opportunities um, on my farm based on what's worked with other people and based on what we see can work on your farm. Certainly, I think one of the reasons farmers come to us is the certification part of the puzzle. Um, if farmers were really great at paperwork, they'd all be accountants probably rather than farmers. And, and we're accountants, but we have got a process. We do have a system in place to help manage all that information, track all that information, put it in the formats, and also be that partner uh, that gets the certification process going and keeping it on track. I know one of the stresses that, that farmers um, come across through the point of the year is trying to get their crops in the ground in the spring. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times certification demands are falling in that same time frame, And I know for myself, it's got to be helpful to that farmer to know that they're not missing a, a point of certification or a process or a paperwork that they need completed. They can go to the field and do those things because AgriSecure, working off the plan we've put together, is getting and gathering and helping to keep that information in the pipeline so that certification or recertification then becomes a very simple event with very few, if any, gaps in information necessary to fill in. And then, of course, that marketing side of things. If we're doing everything else right, if we don't do the marketing part, we, we've really not hit the opportunity that was before us. And I think we understand a little about the market, as, as most farmers understand a little about the market. But taking it to that next level with the organic marketing services offered through FBN uh, with our customers or people that aren't our customers, that want to market grain through a professional that helps them identify and plan a strategy for how their market bushels are going to be distributed into the marketplace. Um, I think that's a very important part of what we do as well. Thank you, Pete. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, I want to encourage others to continue to ask questions. We've got a few questions during the session, and then we have a number of questions that uh, participants posed uh, when they registered. And so we'll, we'll work through those, but continue to raise your questions. I'm actually going to hop back uh, to this slide because a question came up on this slide. And I think there's one that's related to it. So Pete, I'll take the first one. And then the second question I might have you hop in on. So the question was, um, you know, the trend of organic corn in the past four years is falling. What will we? What will set the long-term price level? Um, and it is true that uh, prior to about five years ago, organic corn was trading in a range of probably twelve dollars plus. Uh, in the last four years, it's kind of traded between seven dollars and ten fifty, um, and that's just been the trading range that we've been in. Uh, for us, I think there's two things that are you know, not unusual that will set the long-term price trend that's uh, supply and demand. From the demand side, there continues to be growing consumer interest in organic foods. Uh, COVID has actually continued to um, really uh, increase demand as, as consumers continue to eat at home or starting to eat at home more often and have a reinvigorated interest in eating healthy food. And so the market for organic turkey, organic chicken, organic dairy 
in organic eggs has really strengthened and continues to strengthen and has a long-term projection. So from the demand side, we believe that the demand is going to be there. And the real question is, what happens with the supply? And there's two elements to supply for feed grains. Uh, one is domestic production, and the other uh, will be imports. On the import side, um, there's a growing awareness and a, an acute understanding that there's concerns about imports potentially being fraudulent. And the USDA uh, National Organic Program just went through a process uh, called Strengthening Organic Enforcement, uh, where they wrote some new rules that have, and the public uh, comment period on those has just uh, fit, closed, and they will go back and review the public comments and come out with a uh, enhanced set of rules around organic enforcement efforts, both domestically and abroad, sometime this spring, which will have a rollout period uh, likely over a year or a little bit longer than that in certain instances. It's our belief that that is going to tighten up the import supply chain to make sure that fraudulent grains aren't coming into the United States, which should therefore enhance the opportunity for domestic growers. And on the domestic side, it's a, it's, it's a, a question of acres and yields. And how does the market respond uh, to continuing to add organic acres or not? Um, we you know, overall, I think we, we believe that we're kind of going to be in that $7 to $9.50, $10 price range moving forward and that seeing some of those spikes unless there's a certain weather event um, up above $10.50 uh, would be fairly unlikely. So that's kind of our view, at least on organic corn, organic soybeans. Uh, soybean prices have remained fairly strong in that $18 to $20 window. Um, and we continue to see uh, good demand there. I don't know, Pete, if you have anything else you'd add on yeah, uh, good, to that question. Yeah, a, couple, yeah, a couple things I'd add to that is certainly the, is important that market price, um, whether it's an organic or conventional bushel, uh, but the two do not exist in vacuums in and of themselves. And I think what you're going to see, and I think what we've seen in the past, just talking about the conventional market first, is that as we see market prices move forward, um, in conventional, we seem to deal less and less with pure supply and demand, meaning that as the market price tends to move up, suppliers especially, whether it's a provider of land that you're paying cash rent for, or a provider of seed or fertilizer, they tend to price towards value, price towards what that farmer expects to pay or is willing to pay for those inputs. And eventually what happens then is that even if you have a rising market price, your expenses tend to almost override. And on the way down, as the market tends to move lower with expansive supply, those costs are still there. It may take a, a two or three or a five year um, cycle to have that happen, but we've seen it in the past and I expect to see it again as we're seeing some profitability come back into the conventional side. Conversely, when you think about what impact that has on the organic side, if there's some profitability today in conventional production acres, they're going to cannibalize some of those poor organic farmers that are out there. They may retire, they may decide they can't manage weeds at a profitable level, and then it's just easier to give up and go back to conventional. But what that does is that reduces the supply by reducing acres that are out there and potentially reduces farmers too. So in a, in, a, in a counterintuitive way, this market rise is going to be extremely good for organic farming longer term, not just in the short run. But there again, because there's less inputs in organic and more return on management, there tends to be less of a, a overriding of expenses when the market price isn't there. So that overall profitability, and, and I think in, in some ways just understanding and having more ability to manage that risk to me, makes this a perfect time to be thinking about organics. The, 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 the old Chinese proverb, when's the best time to plant a tree? 25 years ago, when's the second best today? We're going to see that again in organics, that three years from now, when this conventional market price breaks, we're going to look back and say, gosh, you know, while I had some profitability on my conventional acres, it really made sense. I should have gone ahead and bit the bullet. And if the margins were narrower to get through that transition period, now today, three years later, I'm collecting that revenue from an organic bushel rather than in that commodity where I'm sitting there waiting for a government bailout or check 
because my expenses are now more than the than the uh, bushel price because we've overproduced. Thanks, Pete. So the other question we had on this slide was, and for those of you who may have missed it, you know, the break-even here assumes $905 in total expenses per acre. Uh, the question uh, was, can we break that down? Um, and Tim, I don't have the exact numbers uh, in the back of my hand. Uh, it's something that uh, if you want to follow up, we can we can talk through in more detail. Um, but Pete, do you want to talk through just kind of the big buckets of expenses and you know how they look relative to conventional? So obviously, uh, you know, rent is included in here, and I mm -hmm. think uh, for this example, is a three hundred dollar rent. Right. Um, and then the other yeah. big buckets, just kind of rough levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, your your budgeting in, in conventional organics are really similar, and, and like uh, Steve said, your your land your land cost is going to be fairly consistent uh, between organic and conventional uh, farming operations. At least that's what we found. There there tends to be a higher value maybe by the tenant where he may pay for the purpose or the 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 resource but it's not usually out of line with where the, the conventional market is. Um, seed is another big component, but for the most part, you're using either organic seed or conventional seed without seed treatments that would void um, the organic standards. So seed's kind of a push to a lower expense in organics. Um, fertilizer, um, most of your commercial fertilizers are have that set price to them. When you go to organics, you're looking at primarily manures, and so you're going to have probably some higher transportation costs, but based on your ability to buy and location is how close or far away from supply you are, they can be pretty comparable, but as you get into areas where there's not as much livestock, that fertility part of the puzzle can go up. Um, there are products out there for insects and for leaf diseases in organic. They tend to be narrower spectrum, but yet effective, um, so it's kind of a push there if that's a necessary cost. One of your bigger costs in organic is going to be your field work. Um, if you're using custom rates, you're going to be making more passes on that field. That's going to be on your budget a higher dollar amount. Now, that being said, if you own that equipment rather than have everything custom done, there is a value in ownership and the depreciation value is reduced, even though you do have operational costs that are going to continue to go like fuel and oil and repairs and things like that. So your infield costs probably going to be a little more with organic than what you're seeing uh, with conventional. But by the same token, do I need that um, $120,000 planter or do I need a $10,000, $12,000 planter? Um, that's one of the things we tend to try to preach is when you're looking at new um, products for your farm, if you're in organics, look at keeping that break even as low as possible and keeping that machinery component low definitely helps with the overall profitability. So long story short, certainly the market price is going to change. Expenses fall into different buckets in different ways, but, but keeping your costs low, having the ability to access information in the market to get a fair price or the best price available, and putting it in a, a budget that takes into account the, the ebb and flow of your rotation, both from a financial and from a business point of view, those are the things that are going to make you successful in organics. And this is one of the areas where you know we're happy to, and Tim specifically, if you want to go deeper, look at, you know, we have some rules of thumb. We're happy to go deep into field plans. And one of the areas we work with our members on is building out those robust field plans and also where rotation can really have an impact on your year-to-year -year expenses. You know, your fertility needs are going to change based upon what is, you know, in front of that in the rotation. Um, and so can, you know, while we have good rules of thumbs to start with, it's always working to refine it down to your farm. I hope that answered your question. And Pete, you touched upon another question that we got beforehand. It was around, you know, any seed treatments or inoculants that you can't use in organics or you can't use during the transition process. And do you want to speak speak a little bit about the, the ability to use or seed treatments it, and inoculants or farm. whether, what's that? I, I think what you, what you want to think about when you're um, looking at any input that goes onto that farm, 
automatically assume it is not compliant with organic and then go through the steps to prove that it is. I mean, working with us at AgriSecure, we go back with the customer, identify the product, look for the OMRI label, make sure that it passes the certification process with the uh, certification company, get it in a written approval email so that we're, we're consistent and good to go. That being said, there are seed treatments that are out there. Um, I know from my experience, and I, I think Bryce and, and people he's worked with will attest to it. If you're thinking about seed treatments in, in starting with corn and soybeans, because we typically plant later, we run into fewer issues with those pathogens in the soil that reduce or weaken stands. Um, we're not pushing in corn the first week of April to get maximum sunlight, to get that maximum yield. That's, and it's gonna stay in the ground for three and a half, four weeks before it comes out. We're waiting and putting that seed in the ground when the temperature in the soil is 10, 15 degrees warmer, when within a week that corn plant is up and out of the ground and soybeans even quicker. So seed treatments don't have as much value there. While we're talking about seed treatments too, also include your cover crops. If you're doing any cover crops, those seed treatments have to be compliant with the organic standards or you can lose certification there. Um, all those chemicals, uh, fungicides, insecticides we wanna talk about, an area that can trip you up as well, anything you put or was put into that manure. If it's a pit additive, it's a, if it's a bacterial product, if it's something that goes in that is um, foreign to that manure in its natural state, we have to identify it and then we have to make sure that it is a compliant product. There are products that are OMRI approved or approved by the certification companies, but a number of them are not because they contain products that are not compliant with the organic standards. So it's certainly something to be thinking about before you start transition, if you're working with manure that does have an additive that's a non-approved product, you want to be aware of that and make sure you're clear before you get started with that manure application in the field that it is a compliant product. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> uh, the next question is when do you need to actually work with a start working with a certifier? And so traditionally, the way that it's worked is that the time you needed to engage a certification agency, and, and actually I'll take a step back uh, and explain how the industry is structured very quickly. So the USDA has created the National Organic Program. Uh, the National Organic Program sets the guidelines for which uh, any entity that is bringing an organic product to market, <clears throat> excuse me, needs to follow uh, to be able to sell it as USDA certified organic. So that could be a farming operation, or it could be a handler, uh, or it could be uh, a company that's uh, creating a packaged good product that gets sold at the grocery store. So those regulations cover the entire industry. To be certified as organic, you need to work with an accredited certification agency, and the National Organic Program uh, sets the standards and accredited certification agencies. In transition, Historically, you haven't had to work with a certifier until the year that you are going to sell certified organic grains. That being said, they're going to look back and you have to have proof of what occurred in the field and records for anything that was put on the field during the transition period of 36 months. And plus everything that's happened in that field and all the products and records related to it for that year of organic production. So uh, you don't need to do that. Now there is some um, discussion around whether uh, you might need to uh, do something a little bit lighter uh, during the transition period to at least have a certification agency say, look, they have a transition plan in place um, and that is tied to organic uh, or transition uh, crop insurance, and that's something that the industry starting that you know we're trying to clarify and understand exactly what's re required. This year was a year where we we're going to work on that, but with COVID, things got a little bit muddier. So just to summarize, you don't need to start working with the certifier and get anything certified until the start of the crop year 
um, that you're going to actually sell an organic product. So I hope that helps. But, but um, one thing I would add to that, Steve, is that while that's true with the certifier, I think that our space in the marketplace of um, making sure we're coaching people in the proper steps necessary for certification, sometimes people tend to lump us in with the certification companies. And while we do work closely with both the farmer and the certification company, having us on board in that early step, earliest steps, uh, tends to save a lot of problems later. Yep. We just had one question come in about, can we share a website or a newsletter to receive a comprehensive list of organic crop prices available and where the markets are located? Uh, Scott, unfortunately, uh, there isn't a free service out there um, that we're aware of that does this. Uh, and the reason being that uh, the organic market is very regional in nature. Um, and very fragmented, and because there is no futures market associated with it, it tends to be more opaque. As a result of that, AgriSecures launched our organic grain marketing service, which is a service that we um, have a fee associated with. Uh, it goes beyond just listing uh, what the who are the end users or the, the brokers interested in, what are the prices that they're willing to bid. Um, that's part of the service, but it really works to help understand your operation, what are the constraints, what are the opportunities you have, what are your cash flow needs, and to build out a marketing plan. Uh, and once that marketing plan has been established to um, help keep you informed of what's happening more on the macro level as well as in the regional level uh, for the region you're in, identifying the right opportunities for you to sell, and then understanding some of the the pros and cons of different end users. So, you know, what is delivery like? You know, are they slow payers or do they pay on time? Things of that nature. Um, and so uh, that's that's something that we offer and happy to talk about that offline. And I know that we're starting to get a little crunched on time and we have a lot of other questions that people had asked. So um, I'm gonna hop into the next one, which is, uh, one question was about software systems. So um, are there software systems out there to help track all the field activities in a way that's easy to provide for certification and to track the paperwork associated with it? And that's one of the reasons that uh, actually AgriSecure offers our MyFarm platform, and that's one of the reasons that the business was launched. Our members, our founders, as they transitioned their farms into organic and got into organic production, realize that um, there weren't good solutions out there for organic farms, that a lot of the other solutions were developed for conventional farms and so didn't carry some of the nuanced um, uh, or, or meet some of the needs that are more nuanced for organic farms um, or were very complex and time consuming to operate. And so what we really did is looked at what does an organic farm need and apply the 80-20 rule saying we think we get 80% of the value out of 20% of the functionality. So how can we build something that is simple for an organic farmer to use and to deploy and reduces a lot of the time and effort related to certification? <clears throat> um, I apologize, my, I'm losing my voice here a little bit. Um, and then the other part of the question is what are other farmers using? And so in our, in what we found in our members is that before AgriSecure, they're either using a paper filing system, um, which can vary from a stack of papers on a desk to something that's very well organized, but does have reams and reams of paper, um, and then Excel spreadsheets. And one of the challenges with the Excel spreadsheets is that it might be good for managing that year, but then pulling together three to five years of information on a field and looking at what's happening across those fields, what's happening from profitability, <clears throat> what are the field plans that are working, what are the field plans that might need some refinement, that becomes challenging. And that's one of the benefits of uh, our system or any other farm management system is that, you know, you can look at your data not only within a crop year and get alerts about how to, what you need to do um, and uh, make it easy to track those activities. We can also look at the enterprise over time, so looking backwards as well as going forward in your crop rotation, 
which is even more critical for an organic operation relative to a conventional. <clears throat> um, Pete, we got, I'm going to hand this one over to you so maybe I can get my voice back. Uh, we had one question around organic no-till and one that I think is in somewhat uh, related around cereal rye termination. So do you want to just kind of share our perspective on no-till and organic um, and then maybe see a few words on what you've seen work and not work on cereal rye termination? Okay. Well, I, I think one thing about no-till, um, it certainly has its place in agriculture. Uh, we've seen in areas where there's uh, less rainfall, uh, we've seen in areas um, that can manage uh, effectively that trash with the uh, better machinery that we have today versus maybe 10 or 15 years ago that no-till works extremely well. Um, in organics, though, it becomes sort of a challenge and it becomes sort of a trade-off. Um, Certainly, if you're a farmer and you're looking at C and D slope ground, um, no-till is a very effective way of managing those acres to reduce soil erosion. And with the chemistry and fertility, those acres can be productive acres. When you start looking at, do those really profile well for organic? They probably don't profile well. So my advice would do, be to no-till those fields. But as you think about organics, uh, because you're getting a diversity of the rotation, um, because your uh, timing is going to be a little bit different in that um, you're going to want to plant later. Um, you're going to want to manage more weeds uh, as they emerge early before and terminate them before you put in the seed that you desire in, in, in either corn or soybeans or using cover crops or using cereal crops uh, in kind of a relay mechanism to, to keep the weeds beat down. Um, No-till is, is just not uh, refined well enough. Uh, there are some tools out there that are making it um, possible for people to take a look on a smaller scale, whether that's being able to come in and flame a field. Uh, there are more sophisticated um, methods of weed management within the row mechanically that, that have enhanced things. Um, is it anything I'm ready to recommend a farmer jump into today? Probably not. Um, that being said, I my farming career, I ridge tilled, and so I was doing a form of no-till. I think that sort of approach can work on acres uh, within organics, but I haven't seen a lot of data and I've only seen a couple farmers uh, do it, but they're doing it successful, but it's, it's an enhanced management. Um, we wanna think about making that transition to uh, organic from conventional as easy as possible. And the no-till part of it really adds complexity to it um, that can be really challenging. Um, certainly when we talk about cereal rye um, and other crops like that that you can terminate, uh, there's a really good value in being able to smother out weeds and then having the chemical release in the soil to reduce germination of competing weeds. Um, it's a process of managing if you're coming in and no-tilling into a cereal grain like that, of terminating that mechanically uh, with roller or crimpers to do that. What we find is that it's possible. We also find that as much as people wanna make a science out of it, it tends to be an art to have it done correctly. And that if you don't do it correctly, what's your backup plan? What's your plan B in case of that scenario? That can be very difficult to get those kind of yields that you need if you're not able to terminate that crop. So like most things, we recommend farmers start small on, a, on an area uh, that's representative, but not a, a big financial um, risk and incorporate that process in a small trial to be able to see how it works and what the pitfalls are on that farm, um, rather than try to take it on every acre every year. Uh, we know there are guys out there that are doing well with crimping. Uh, we also know that the year they did well was not their first year. It's been the years since. So there is a learning curve involved with, uh, with managing roller crimping, uh, rye, and then also, in some cases, terminating other cover crops. Thank you, Pete. Uh, one, one, encur wanted to continue to encourage people to uh, raise any questions they have. Uh, we have a few more here. One was <clears throat> um, lease terms uh, and strategies for uh, transition or organic lease uh, of leases. Uh, I'll say a few things, Pete, and then maybe you can hop in. <clears throat> uh, one of the concerns that we've 
sometimes had with members is uh, whether their landlord uh, is going to be interested in having um, their land transition to organic or not. Um, and, and, and this is, this is one where we've, you know, had success in making sure that we can outline what is the plan for the farm to be managed uh, very professionally and especially for weeds to be taken care of in a professional manner. And it really comes back to making sure that, you know, you have a thoughtful plan, uh, that your landlord knows what are your resources available to uh, manage that. and. Uh, oftentimes, starting with some of your own land, uh, if you have land, to have a proof point uh, uh, of, of what organics really looks like versus the myth of what organics uh, is in many people's minds. In terms of leases, we certainly recommend having a longer lease, uh, especially if you're going to go through transition. And so at that point, we would you know, encourage a, a five-year lease uh, tenure. In terms of other components around that lease, it really depends on you know what is the landlord willing to uh, engage in. Uh, if it's a crop share lease or something like that, um, obviously it's a co-investment during those transition years, which can be beneficial uh, with the upside. Um, in terms of cash leases, at times we found some landlords who are willing to or understand and account for the fact that transition is an investment in the land and participate in some way, uh, shape, or form uh, during those transition years, understanding that um, the value is going to be in the long-term cash generated from the leases that they have in organics, as well as uh, you know, the improvement to the soil health and the dynamics in the field. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that, Pete. Yeah, I, I think one thing I want to add is that um, when a farmer is going through that transition and then that certified organic status, that status goes with the farmer on that piece of ground. It doesn't reside with the landlord. So that if you go through the process of certifying that ground as organic, um, a future potential renter cannot come in and take over that ground as certified organic without you assigning them that right. So. While you want to work with the landlord and going towards organic has certain benefits, as, as Steve mentioned, where maybe uh, we're trading off the reduction of chemistry um, in, and that improves soil versus some of the other things we do, uh, you're going to be in control of that certification on that farm. So um, it gives you the ability to work with landlords and, and to some extent exclude potential tenants if you're doing things right with that landlord. Or the other side is you just are not going to be able to kick, be kicked off by somebody who decides they want to come in and bid $10 more an acre if it comes to that with the landlord. That's a really good point. Thank you, Pete. And then the final question um, is one around carbon credits for organic land. Uh, and this is one where uh, I would say there's no straightforward answer. There's been a lot of discussion, obviously, around carbon credits and carbon markets that's related to um, uh, conventional or organic row crop production. Um, we've had a number of discussions with different entities involved in those markets. Uh, and the one thing that I would say is what, there's a few different approaches, one is carbon abatement and one is carbon remediation. So are you reducing the amount of carbon that's being used for producing a crop uh, that can come through, you know, nitrogen use efficiency and fertilizer efficiency and practices. And another one is based upon how much carbon you might be sequestering in a crop. Uh, and the discussions we've had, um, oftentimes for the, the programs, they'll look at the amount of tillage and its impact, um, and but we've what we understand, and again, this is something where any individual to have to have discussions with whoever the counterparty would be. That um, you know, using the amount of tillage we do in organic crops does not disqualify you, but it would certainly be a part of the consideration and the overall calculation for how much soil, how much carbon might be sequestered, or how much carbon is 
used in 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 an approach. Um, but one of the things we're doing is we're continuing to just investigate and understand and see how these markets evolve and find the right opportunities for our member to, members to potentially participate and capture value from them. For us right now, it's not quite clear. Um, however, if there's somebody on the call who has done a deep dive and um, you know, has some expertise they'd like to share with us, I'd certainly be open to having that conversation because uh, it is one that is complex and evolving. Uh, and as, as with anything with our members, we want to make sure we're very thoughtful and taking kind of a stepwise approach into new opportunities versus jumping in and um, being caught off guard or finding ourselves in a situation that's not meeting our expectations. Yeah, I guess a and, couple. And, and so, Pete, go, I, I just one quick. Mm -hmm. go, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, uh, I, would, I would add a couple things. I saw there was a question that came in to clarify exactly the operator on the farm carries that certification, not the landowner. Um, but in terms of things that are out that are available to farmers who are conventional farming, we're also available to farmers that are organically farming. So there are a number of opportunities to sign up and, and take advantage of government uh, programs and also conservation programs uh, can work very well within an organic structure. Um, we've even kind of joked internally, it's almost, it could be a full-time job for somebody to go through and mine all the programs that could be available for a farmer to use while they're doing organic production. And they can make a pretty good income doing that. So, and I think as we see more emphasis this next coming year, especially on producing uh, higher value conventional crops, that there's gonna be a bigger pool of dollars or fewer people into that pool of dollars looking to do some of those conservation practices that would align with an organic strategy. And so not to, thank you, Pete, and not to, to, to go back to this question about certification and who holds the certification uh, and, and to kind of beat a dead horse, horse, but I wanna be very clear around it. So the organic farming operation gets certification to raise organic crops on a specific parcel of land. Um, so that piece of land um, is maintains its organic certification in two in a few different dimensions. One, making sure that you have an organic system plan or OSP that is approved by an accredited certification agency and follows all of the guidelines required for the National Organic Program. And for the following year, you not only need to do that, but you also have to have all of the records associated for the last, since that land was uh, certified organic in the transition period for the last five years. And so that's where the entity that holds those records has the ability to maintain that certification. And traditionally that has been the organic farming operation and the organic farm is the one that gets certified to farm any, any specific parcel of land as organic for a crop year. So if that wasn't clear, uh, Tim, feel free to, uh, to reach out and I'll, uh, you can just uh, email me or email contact at agrosecure.com and I'm happy to have a further discussion to, to clarify it. So we did have one final question and then we'll wrap it up that, that where somebody asked prior to the meeting that, you know, can you go talk through the overall challenges of transition? That's very much what we tried to call out here. Uh, obviously within a, you know, hour, hour and a half, we don't have a opportunity to be comprehensive in calling out every challenge. We wanted to focus on uh, some of the key uh, pitfalls that we've seen members or other organic uh, farms struggle with during the transition time period. And as one of our founders says, there's no one thing in an organic pro uh, production system that um, you can't manage. It's the fact of this, the totality of all the different things that need to come together that really brings in a level of complexity that you need to be prepared for. And that's one of the areas where AgriSecure really tries to, to um, 
be a resource and support for farmers in helping manage and reduce that level of complexity to make sure that the system comes together in a way that works for your farm and your operation uh, is in as efficient and effective manner as possible. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up. I do want to just let everybody know that we do have a few more webinars coming up uh, on December 2nd and December 8th. So on December 2nd, we'll be talking through weed management and five principles for long-term success in weed management in organic systems. And then on December 8th, we'll be talking about optimizing organic returns and the role that rotations, execution, and risk management play in building that right foundation for long-term economic success in organic crops. With that, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, really appreciated the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, and feel free to reach out if there's anything we can do to help you with your journey in organic production. Thank you.